Great, thank you. So uh, welcome everybody. We're incredibly excited today to host this event uh, on navigating the legal landscape of AI in medicine. So just a little background. So uh, I'm Abel Come, a faculty here at the Feinberg School of Medicine. I direct the Institute uh, for Augmented Intelligence in Medicine. IAM's mission is, you can read it there, but I'll paraphrase it. You know, we're really trying to get co combine the best of computational expertise and data science methods with human expertise, with a focus, of course, on advancing medical science and improving human health. So like many institutes here at the Feinberg School of Medicine, we see ourselves as fundamentally uh, collaborative and spanning departments and schools and institutions uh, and disciplines. And we do that not because it's the you know fun thing to do, although it is fun, uh, but it's also because the most pressing and complex challenges today, modern challenges, often require both deep and broad expertise. And today's discussion, I think, is a great example of that. Uh, you've heard a lot about chat GPT. I think some of you, based on our surveys, have even uh, played around with it a little bit, experimented with that. Uh, but one of the magic things about chat GPT is it brought together a diverse number of constituents and interested parties. Like today, we have members from uh, our law school, uh, private law, as well as our rising stars in the Feinberg School of Medicine to bring you a presentation, a series of presentations, and also a discussion about the implications of this new technology uh, from a legal perspective, but again, with a focus, because we're I aim on health. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, uh, Mohammed uh, uh, is going to kick us off. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Mohammed Hosseini, and I'm a postdoc um, researcher at the Department of Preventive Medicine here at Northwestern. Um, and I'm here to provide an introduction about large language models and ChatGPT and their legal implications in healthcare settings. To set the stage, I'd like to explain some terms. So AI or artificial intelligence is a term used to um, refer to systems that mimic human behavior. Within these systems, there's a smaller group of systems called machine learning. Machine learning systems use statistical methods to mimic human behavior. Within this smaller group, there's a yet smaller group called deep learning. These systems use statistical methods to learn from large amounts of data. ChatGPT and large language models belong to this smaller category, and they use textual data or images to be trained. At this stage, you might be thinking, oof, a lot of jargon. I agree. So I've challenged myself for the love of simplicity and accessibility to explain the rest of this presentation such that even a six-year-old would understand. So I hope that I'll succeed. Let's start with something much simpler. Um, search engines. How would you explain search engines in terms of mimicking human behavior to a six-year-old? I don't know about you, I would use the analogy of a librarian. I would say a search engine is like a librarian that shows us the whereabouts of information. You have to say what you need and bam, you get the information. Now, if that is true, if search engines are analogous to what a librarian does, what is ChatGPT? I think ChatGPT is not only mimicking one behavior. And so I've used the analogy of a digital chimera. For those of you who don't know what a chimera is, in Greek mythology, a chimera is a monstrous fire-breathing hybrid that is composed of a goat, a lion, and a snake. Now, let's try to replace these animal heads with human behavior. I think one head is still a librarian. This thing is amazing in finding sources very quickly. The second head is a quick reader. It reads stuff and is able to analyze content based on style, language, you name it, so many parameters. Well, important caveat, this second head of ours is sometimes hallucinating and talks about stuff that don't exist, or it sometimes gets drunk and talks about irrelevant stuff or can produce biased content. The third head is a grammar guru, speedy writer that can summarize and synthesize what 
um, the second head read or what we provided to it as input. Now, funny analogies aside, a technology that combines all these three human behaviors in one entity can be extremely helpful in healthcare. For those of you who attended our previous meeting, there was all kinds of examples from how this could help us become more efficient in terms of note keeping, analyzing existing notes, making predictions. The possibilities seem endless, but only on paper because the medical landscape is heavily regulated and is full of all kinds of checks and balances that are there to protect patients, physicians, healthcare providers, and also the society. As our two legal experts will shortly demonstrate, our EGLE system has already had some contact with digital chimeras or other kinds of artificial intelligence. And we speculate that it is probably vulnerable to some issues that might happen as a result of integrating these systems. So integrating these systems in a legal and responsible way is extremely challenging. Without further ado, I hand it to the next speaker, Andrea, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. I don't have any cool graphics like he does, so it's going to be not as exciting. Um, I'm Andrea Lena. I'm a healthcare attorney at McGuire Woods. We are a large law firm. We have about a thousand attorneys. I am a partner in our um, Chicago office and help lead our digital health innovation and technology practice group. So I work with clients on regulatory compliance matters related to telehealth, remote patient monitoring, um, health apps, EMR, any kind of healthcare technology, anywhere where health meets tech is really where I come in from a legal perspective. So some things to think about um, legal considerations for AI is just to start out with some basic principles that AI technologies and solutions are varied. We've got lots of different types. We've got lots of different facts we're applying them to and circumstances. And so want to say that at the beginning, because this isn't a one size fits all. We're giving you some examples of laws that may apply to the technology, um, but it's all going to be different based on the technology and the facts at hand. And then also what's really interesting about this space and where I spend a lot of time is we are applying really old law to really new technology. So this law wasn't developed with AI in mind. You look at HIPAA, for example, which we're all familiar with, was enacted 27 years ago in 1996, um, which makes me feel very old. But we have um, you know, FDA laws a little bit more recent. We have some new guidance for AI, but for the most part, when you look at the laws that we're applying to artificial intelligence, we're trying to fit them in to an old structure that doesn't quite match up. Um, so we get some misalignment there. So things to consider from a legal perspective as we're talking through this are how do you maintain and assess quality and safety? How do you manage malpractice risk when you're using these tools? How can you approach informed consent? How do you approach the patient provider relationship and how is that impacted? FDA, medical device regulation is another thing to think about. You've got reimbursement. Um, how, are, how is this being paid for by third-party payers or the government? You've got data privacy concerns, as well as managing reputational risks for you as a provider, as well as for your institution. So I want to start out with, like I mentioned, just some of the laws that apply to a variety of different AI technologies to help us issue spot as we get into some of the hypotheticals. So the first thing I want to cover is the Food and Drug Administration, which we're all familiar with, regulates devices, pharmaceuticals. Um, they regulate the sale of medical devices, which are defined as anything, any instrument with the intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or cure mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. So what you're looking at is what is the intended use of this AI to figure out if it is in fact a medical device that has to be approved by the FDA. So you're gonna figure that out by looking at what are the labels and instructions? What is the company saying in press releases, um, statements to the media, presentations, examples, um, to try and figure out kind of what, what is the intended use of this artificial intelligence and is it related to the diagnosis of disease or cure mitigation treatment or prevention? Um, there's been some good guidance that not all software is subject to the FDA. 
there's a lot of software that isn't. For example, healthy lifestyle apps. I have a lot of clients that develop these applications that are related to healthcare, but not necessarily diagnosing or treating. So for example, you may have a health app that allows patient populations to manage chronic conditions, um, manage weight loss, manage, maybe they have um, IBS or IBD and they need to figure out elimination diets. Maybe they have an app that can help them with that. Those are things that are more healthy lifestyle apps, not regulated by the FDA. An example of one of the first FDA approved um, AI devices is called GI Genius. So this device uses AI to assist clinicians in detecting polyps during a colonoscopy. So the AI finds areas of interest, highlights them gr with green square markers, and identifies potential lesions. The studies found that it increases chances of identifying cancer by 13%. So this was an example of a technology that had to be approved by the FDA because it was involved in the diagnosis of disease. Another reg, you know, area to be aware of is the Federal Trade Commission. I think a lot of times people don't think of the FTC as regulating healthcare, um, but it does, and it's really taken an aggressive stance in the last couple of years, which we'll talk about, but the FTC is empowered to prevent unfair methods of competition, unfair deceptive acts or practices. So this is gonna come in when you're looking at maybe the sale of AI that is racially biased, right? So is that, unfair deceptive practice um, impacting commerce. So an example of this on the screen uh, is really interesting. This was a study of 50,000 patients from one large health system that used an algorithm to risk score patients based on potential medical expenditures. So the study actually found there was racial bias in the algorithm. Yeah. No, that's okay. Okay, I'm back. I'm going to close that little box back there. So we okay. Can since we're doing some technical. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm back. Um, so basically, um, since black patients typically have lower costs, but that's related to disparities in access, implicit bias in the healthcare system, the algorithm was saying these individuals have a lower risk score. So they weren't being put in special programs like being sent to their um, PCP, their primary care provider and being um, sent to programs that may help them when they needed it. So they found if they corrected this algorithm, um, the additional care for black patients went from 17% to 46%. So this is an example of bias in the algorithm that on its face looks great and sounds great, um, but when you dig behind it, you find some issues. Um, HIPAA wanna cover, this is old law, new tech problem, right? Been a lot around for a very long time. And just to talk about some of the defined terms here, just so you understand what we're talking about is first is PHI. So this is anything related to your health condition, provision of healthcare or payment of healthcare. This is gonna be things that are obvious like your name, your address, also include things not so obvious like your IP address, uh, maybe photographs that don't necessarily show your face, vehicle identifiers, serial numbers, account numbers. Um, so if you have this kind of information, the next question you're going to ask yourself to see if HIPAA applies is looking at, is this a covered entity that we're dealing with? So is this a health plan, a healthcare clearinghouse, clearinghouse, which is a technical, not necessary for this, but helps pay claims or a healthcare provider who transmits any health information in electronic form in connection with transactions. Again, that gets to be a technical definition, but basically means if you aren't just a private pay provider, you accept some sort of third-party reimbursement. So if you are not a health plan and you are not a healthcare provider who accepts third-party payment, you're outside of HIPAA. So this is going to actually not cover a lot of people. All the health apps, not all of them, but many of the health apps that you download on your phone, those are not covered entities. Those are not subject to HIPAA. So there's gonna be a different set of rules that apply there. Um, HIPAA also covers business associates. So this is going to be 
any entity that receives PHI on behalf of the covered entity, then they become subject to HIPAA as well. This would include, for example, software vendors. So this is interesting for AI, because if you are using um, a software technology like AI and you want to put PHI into it, then you have to have a business associate agreement or you are not in compliance with HIPAA. Um, here's an example of uh, Google's project, gathering personal health data on millions of Americans. Lots of people super surprised. Why does Google have all my health information? This has to be illegal. Um, it's actually completely fine under HIPAA. This is allowable. Google entered into a business associate agreement with Ascension. It is subject to certain requirements on how it can use that health information. But while it's really great headlines and it's concerning to a lot of people, at the same time, it's completely legal. So I think that's a way that people don't necessarily realize kind of what's, what's happening with their health data. Again, not all health data is HIPAA data. HIPAA doesn't apply to many of those consumer-driven health apps and devices. Um, it's an actor-covered rule. So when you're figuring out if HIPAA applies, you're going to look at who is using that data, who's inputting the data, who's holding the data, and then to figure out whether or not it's protected. So you could have the exact same information that your healthcare provider holds about you that's protected by HIPAA. And if you put that exact same information into a health app on your phone, not protected by HIPAA. So two totally different rules, despite it being you know, exactly the same information. Um, here's an example of the FTC getting involved in the sharing of health information. So Flow Health, this is a fertility tracking app used by many, many million, millions of women um, to track their periods, to track whether they're pregnant. Um, Flow app was sharing all that sensitive information with Facebook, Google, and others to sell personalized ads. Um, wasn't telling anyone about it, said they weren't doing it, but they were. So the FTC came after them for that. This was just a couple of weeks ago. GoodRx, very similar case. They were providing information to Facebook and Google and not telling consumers about it. They got hit with a $1.5 million fine, which is quite low, really. I mean, the potential penalties for some of these cases for this um, health, I don't know if it's on the slide, um, for this health date, health breach um, statue is actually $40,000 per violation per day. Um, so if you think about every violation, every individual, every day, $40,000, I mean, that's crippling, that would ruin your business. So it's definitely something that um, our clients are paying attention to. Let's see, is this Dan? I think this is you, right? Potentially. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, so I'm, I'm Dan Lina. I'm the director of law and technology initiatives at Northwestern. I'm also a senior lecturer. I have a joint appointment in the law school and in the engineering school, this, the computer science school specifically. And so we're just trying to give a, a high level overview of some of the law that applies. And uh, specifically, what we might, what we want to uh, talk about here is uh, one, one of the other questions is, is liability. And uh, it looks like our slides got jumbled here a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, so one of the things is that this is somewhat uncharted territory. There isn't case law to date uh, on these issues. And of course, in the U.S., we have a common law system, so we rely on courts to make court decisions and say how the law is going to apply. But so far, we don't have a heck of a lot of case law. And so that, that leaves some questions. And one of the concerns here is that, well, is AI going to end up elevating the standard of care, which is, that would be our hope, right? Care is going to improve and, and everyone can use it in a way to improve care and, and, under, and know what their risk for liability might be. Uh, but one of the other concerns is that we might not adopt fast enough that uh, changing the standard of care with AI would be um, in, in the best interest of, of parties. So who are the individuals that might be liable? Uh, there's there's individual providers, doctors, nurses, other medical professionals. There's also the institutions who employ them, uh, or it might be more complicated, like there might be independent contractor relationships, and you have to kind of tease that out, but that's an issue in this, in this whole analysis as far as liability. And then the developers of the AI tools could be liable as well. One of the things that we would like to talk about here is that institutions and individuals using tools need to be very uh, put a lot of thought into thinking about what are the terms of use, right? What's my contract with this provider? What does it say about liability? What does it say about the way data is going to be protected? Things like that. 
Alex, you want to talk a little bit about some analysis already of uh, malpractice claims. Of course. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Carvalho with Infectious Diseases. I'm pointing out this interesting uh, article that Dr. John Flaherty pointed to our group about um, litigation and malpractice. And basically, as you guys can see on the graph, uh, they published this study on the New England in 2006. They had about a 1,400 um, random sample of claims that were closed. And they plotted on the x-axis the amount of evidence supporting those claims. And on the y-axis, just the sheer amount of those claims. And in the bars, you can see the proportion of those that got paid and those that didn't. And you can see in general, the trend is as the evidence becomes more mounting of malpractice, um, it, the chances are that you're more likely to get your claim paid. However, what's interesting to me on this graph, it's the left side. If you look at it, uh, even claims that had little or no evidence, uh, some of these claims are uh, called like frivolous claims, uh, they still have like a one in five chance of actually getting paid. Um, so ChatGPT is coming into this environment and likely is going to disrupt the whole process. And we are still figuring out how this is going to affect the legal ecosystem. So Jim, go ahead. Yeah, and that's a great point, Alex. I mean, and, and from the, the legal perspective, discovery, figuring out the facts that relate to a malpractice claim, it's very messy. And so now when we introduce AI, is that going to help improve things so we actually understand better, so there's more transparency, or is it going to make things worse? It's more difficult to unpack exactly what happened and who might be responsible. Okay, so we should talk about what the standard is. Uh, duty, breach, causation, damages, like ask any lawyer and they'll tell you those are the elements for negligence. When we talk about malpractice uh, liability, the key really comes down to determining what, what exactly is the standard of care. So doctors, medical professionals have a duty to treat patients consistent with the applicable standard of care. And then in, every, in any given state where there's a malpractice claim, the question is, well, what is that standard of care? And in most states, the national standard, but in some states, it might just be uh, compared to other doctors in that state, for example. So physicians and medical professionals must use the same degree of knowledge, skill, and ability as an ordinarily careful professional would exercise under similar circumstances. So what does that mean for AI, right? Well, we have a standard of care right now where we're really not using AI in care. So when AI tools are introduced, what does that mean? How, how does the standard of care change? And we have just a quick hypothetical here from Price, Gerke, and Cohen. And so assume a physician is treating a new patient with a chronic migraines. The, the standard of care is old drug, tryptan, with known moderate side effects. Another treatment, new drug, is approved for non-migraine use in cancer patients, but observational studies have shown that it may reduce migraines dramatically. However, new drug has potential, potentially severe side effects and so is discouraged for using treatment in migraines. The physician will prescribe one drug or the other. The physician enters her patient's information into the electronic health record and an embedded AI system makes a recommendation for that treatment. Now, if we were using systems like this, one of the things we'd ask right away is like, well, how does it make the recommendations? And we'd do some diligence before we'd use a system. But even assuming that we've done that diligence and we feel confident that the, that the system gives us good recommendations, here's a table of eight possible outcomes. And I won't walk through any, every one of these, but the, the, the outcome here is that you are, as a, as a prescribing doctor, you could find yourself at a greater level of risk because if you follow the advice of an AI system that says to provide the new drug and there's a resulting injury, then the question is, well, if you didn't, you haven't followed the standard of care because the standard of care is to, to use old drug. And so you could find yourself liable under those circumstances. And so the concern here is we have an AI tool that's coming in and may in fact be, be recommending a course of action that is going to be better for patients on balance, but the standard of care is going to force uh, physicians to uh, to go go back to the old the old standard, right? Not not adjust their advice. So in in that sort of world, we'd have these AI tools would only be valuable as confirmatory advice only, right? And that that's not the world we want to find ourselves in. Uh, so so how are we going to unpack that? How is that all going to work? Uh, 
One other thing I'm going to briefly touch on, because we want to make sure that we can get into the hypotheticals that we set up to have some discussion about it. So there's a lot of discussion about AI. It's the Wild West. There's not any law that applies. Well, we've already seen that's not true. There's plenty of law that applies, particularly in heavily regulated areas like healthcare. But there still are some gaps. And so we're, we're waiting for, for a law to be defined, how that's going to apply. And then at the same time, we see a lot of AI principles evolving, kind of suggesting to us how we should be using AI tools as individuals and inside of organizations. And in fact, we're seeing many of these principles then in being embedded in law that is emerging and being proposed. Here's just an example of some of those principles. So if we're using AI as individuals and as organizations, we should be thinking about privacy, accountability. Who's accountable for these tools? Right? Sometimes you can bring a technology into an organization and it's not really clear, like, like who's looking over this? Who's accountable for this? Who's responsible? Uh, thinking about safety and security, does it work? How do we validate it? Transparency, explainability, fairness, right? That's, that's a million dollar question. That has a lot of aspects to it. Uh, discrimination and bias uh, are parts of that, but there's many other way, questions to think about in connection with fairness. Human control, we want humans in the loop. We want humans making the decisions, right? These tools are meant to empower humans. They're designed by humans. Humans need to be in control. Professional responsibilities around this and the promotion of, of human values. And Andrea mentioned the Federal Trade Commission. They've been getting more and more active in this area and they've been talking about these principles as well. And this is just one example uh, of a publication where they kind of spelled out these principles in a different way directly to businesses talking about being transparent, explain your decision to the consumer, right? And one of the big questions here is informed consent. If we have patients, what do we need to explain? When do we need to get, get consent? You know, what is that relationship with the, with the patient going to look like? Ensure your decisions are fair. Uh, ensuring your data models are robust and empirically sound. I mean, how are we testing these things? How are we validating them? How do we know that they work? And then holding yourself accountable for compliance, ethics, fairness, and non-discrimination. Uh, one thing I, I was talking about contracts and, and what I'm talking about here is generally referred to as soft law. When we think about law, we usually think about laws that are on the books, right, that we can point to and enforce. And we're seeing this emergence of these principles and, and other methods to govern artificial intelligence. And one of the ways to make these things enforceable is to think about the contracts and, and the standards we have in our organizations. How do we embed some of these principles and, and really operationalize them so that we're following them? The people we work with uh, would find themselves liable if they did not adhere to them and so on. Okay, so with that, I think we've kind of set the stage now for, for talking about our, our hypotheticals. Hey everybody, I'm gonna start with one hypothetical case. I'm gonna ask uh, a question to our legal experts and then we hopefully open up to the audience as well for you guys to interact. So like I said, I'm Alex Carvalho. I'm a physician, a fellow in infectious diseases um, and I also do work at the Center for Pathogen Genomics and Microbial Evolution with SARS-CoV-2. So I'm going to discuss um, one outpatient case study here. Um, so it's a 53-year-old female. Uh, it's a patient with paralysis, neurogenic bladder. She needs to do self-catheterizations to remove the urine. Um, and then because of that instrumentation, has recurrent urinary tract infections. And unfortunately, MRSA has been detected in her case. And her insurance company denied an important antibiotic pill that could be used to treat her painful urinary tract infection. MRSA, uh, for those on the audience who doesn't know, it's an aggressive, uh, hardy pathogen. And on her case, the only other option then would be an IV medication based on bacterial culture results. And putting an IV, a central line in somebody when they don't need one, it's a really unnecessary escalation of care and risk. So the infectious diseases provider will appeal to that, but his clinic is overburdened by many such insurance denials on pretty much a daily basis. And he wants to try this uh, chat GPT thing to be hip, I guess, and to help write appeal letters. Uh, so in this scenario, Dan or Andrea, what are the potential legal pitfalls that this uh, provider can incur? And what is the best risk mitigation strategy here? Yeah, well, I think one of the first questions we would ask uh, in looking at this is, why was it denied in the first place? And why would uh, um, the physician think that ChatGPT would be helpful, right, in, in solving this problem? Um, you know, presumably most organizations are going to have guidelines about how to use different technologies and which, uh, which circumstances they might be useful. But I think that's the starting point, right, thinking about negligence and trying to understand 
Now, there's a human empowered to make a decision there, and they're choosing to use this technology. How are they using it? What's Why do they think using the technology would be beneficial in that situation? So that's kind of the starting point. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first things I think about is HIPAA here. Um, so you're going to the provider, um, he or she is submitting insurance claims. So if they are a covered entity provider that's submitting third party payments, they're subject to HIPAA. Um, there's this information that would go to the insurance provider about the individual's health information, right? Their age, their date of birth, um, information about medications they're taking, their account numbers, et cetera. Um, so if you take that information and you plug it into chat GPT, um, you're sharing PHI for treatment and payment and operations purposes, but with a software system where you likely do not have a business associate agreement, I would say I'm assuming for this purposes, for this purpose that you don't have one, if ChatGBT would enter into a business associate agreement with you, then that's a little bit of a different discussion. But so in this situation, I would say you would not want to put in any PHI into ChatGPT. If you did, you likely are dealing with a HIPAA breach. What you could do, however, is you could use ChatGPT to structure your appeal letter. There's a lot of pieces in an appeal letter that just dear so and so blah, 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 information that's not specific to the individual patient. So having it build out that template for you is a great example of how you could use ChatGPT. I would pause there and say you want to work with your institution if they allow you to use this technology, right? There's lots of different things to think about there. And then also the question of do you trust what ChatGPT Chat is putting into your appeal letter? You're the provider, you're the licensed professional, you at the end of the day have the responsibility to make sure that that information that you're submitting to insurance is accurate. If it's not, you could be dealing with a situation where you've provided false information and been paid by a third-party care and government um, inaccurately, which has a whole bunch of consequences around the False Claims Act and, and other issues. So those are the kind of things that I think of. So I think HIPAA and then accuracy and how are you guaranteeing and showing that Definitely need to check it. And just briefly on the terms of the service, if for ChatGPT, they give you several warnings not to rely on the advice, and it's in their terms and conditions saying uh, that that it may be incorrect. And it tells you that if you were to have a claim for liability, it's limited to the amount you paid in the prior 12 months or $100. So you know, they're basically saying we're not on the hook for anything for the most part. And before we move to the next case, uh, what if insurance companies also move to employ ChatGPT to kind of like fast track claims? Is this kind of like the battle of the robots coming up? I'd be interested in hearing uh, Mohammed and Kathy if they have thoughts on that on, on how you'd see that escalating. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, oh, first of all, hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Gao. I'm a critical care physician, and I do research on machine learning applied to electronic health record data. But yeah, no, I think it's a really interesting question and something that's been thrown around online is kind of in the educational realm. What if students, so what if teachers use ChatGPT or a similar large language model to write test questions and then students are using it to answer those test questions? And that goes back to the teacher who uses the technology to grade those questions. You can kind of see how something like this might yeah. um, sort of arise on, on both sides. And I don't know that we have an answer to things yet. I don't know people in the insurance um, areas. I don't know if they're already using it. I know certainly you can see on social media, physicians have already started using these technologies for these administrative tasks to help reduce the burden of paperwork that, you know, they have tons and tons of um, uh, that takes a lot of uh, time. So I don't have a great answer, but I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts. Yeah, and I can add to that a little bit. It's just, it's not unusual now for insurance companies to be using artificial intelligence. They're already using these technologies. I mean, saying they're using ChatGPT, I have no idea. Um, but they certainly use technology in order to look at claims and speed up the claims process. Um, one thing to think about from the insurance company perspective is, again, that accuracy piece. Because they have entered into contracts with individuals, with employers, with the federal government saying, we promise we're going to pay for medically necessary services. That's why you are paying us money because we're going to pay for those services. So if they are denying those claims incorrectly, um, then they potentially have liability under those contracts. So that's something to think about. And I completely agree. I don't want to admit that I ever look at TikTok, but sometimes I do. And there was a viral um, video of a physician 
using chat GPT to, you know, do these appeal letters. So it's certainly very interesting and he made very good points and he didn't enter any PHI from what I could tell. So I think he's okay. I don't want to say for sure, but, um, you know, it was interesting to see him watch that and all the, um, excitement there was on social media about those opportunities. I yeah, know. I think that's re really great points. And I think it's a really interesting time that we're in to see and watch these discussions unfold live. And kind of, I think the community as a whole is going to have to come to a consensus after a lot of discussion on what they feel is acceptable, what they feel is not, because right now it's kind of unclear and it's just kind of people are like, I guess I'll, you know, try this, but um, just really interesting time and really interesting discussion. One thing I'll say briefly about this hypothetical is I think it also brings up the point there's lots of different tools out there that are being used. And a matter of fact, our, in our innovation lab, we're working with Abel and, and his colleagues on computable contracts, like thinking about that. And I think some of these tools that we're throwing machine learning at them, there may actually be different approaches that'll end up being more successful in the long run. And this could be a situation like that. Okay, but I think we've got next, there's another example that you were gonna walk through, Andrea, the, the FTC. Oh, um, yeah, I think this is just to touch again on the point of you know, sharing of information when the patient is not aware that that's what's being done. And I think that is very high, um, an area of intense scrutiny right now by the federal government. I mean, we're seeing, I'm seeing these cases constantly where the government is coming out. There was another one on Monday. This was just like a couple of weeks ago, if even that, where they're saying, hey, you guys are sharing this information, this private information with Google and Facebook, and you haven't told anybody about it yet. And so make sure that when you're using these tools, I know no one reads the terms of use. No one, everyone clicks accept, 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 accept. But it really may be once in a while checking it out if you are providing your health information and you don't want it to be shared because chances are probably it may be shared. And so check out those terms and conditions and see if it is in fact an app where you want to share your information. Really great points. Really, really interesting to hear your perspectives and learn about this. Um, I had another hypothetical case. So, and this is kind of more AI integration with electronic health records. So imagine you're a really busy critical care physician. You're trying to triage which patient to admit to your intensive care unit. And it's super busy. You, you just came on service. You already got, you know, four pages about different patients that all, you know, seem concerned and at risk of deterioration. And people are asking if they can come to the ICU. So you're looking at their charts, you know, trying to sort of see who you're going to see first. You're, you're kind of worried about patient A. Um, they all seem sick, but you're like, mm, maybe I should go see patient A. You notice that patient B has a really high sort of risk score based on this algorithm that's embedded in your electronic health record system. And you're like, okay, maybe I'll go see you know patient B first because they have this score, this algorithm is suggesting to me that that might be a um, more um, uh, time sensitive case to evaluate. Unfortunately, while you're busy seeing patient B, patient A actually deteriorates and goes into cardiac arrest, right? So this is something that you could imagine happening with systems that are integrated into the electronic health record system. So some questions that I had about this um, include, you know, we, all, we always consent patients or their families for different procedures, you know, central line placement, bronchoscopy. Do patients and families sort of um, consent for sort of being... Uh, for you using these kinds of algorithms in, in their care? Um, so for the consent question, I think it's a really interesting one where I don't have the answer. Um, and I certainly haven't seen, I haven't seen any case law to suggest one way or the other, but some things to think about is informed consent historically has dealt with, okay, you are performing some procedure on my body, right? So I'm going to explain to you what the concerns are with the surgery, what the risks are, things you need to be thinking about. Here, a little bit different is we're talking about informed consent with how I'm coming up with the decisions to do whatever I'm doing. Um, so it's not quite lined up um, with that traditional, you know, kind of the old law to the new law idea. Um, but physicians in Illinois, for example, are held to a reasonable standard when or not, whether they have to give informed consent. So essentially that means if a reasonable doctor would give informed consent, 
then, or ask for informed consent, then you have to ask for informed consent. So it's a little bit circular. It depends on what um, your colleagues are doing and what is reasonable in the situation. So I think for me, you know, it's a question I can't answer. I'm not a provider. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear from the providers too is, well, what do you think? Do you think it's reasonable? Should we be giving this information? And just a couple other things to think about is, you know, it has to be not just you're telling them what it is. They have to understand it. It has to be informed. Now, if you, the physician, have no idea how this thing works, do they, you know, can you even explain it to them? So I think these are interesting questions around these technologies. And I'm sure, you know, maybe at some point there, I'm sure there will be some lawsuit to question, you know, hey, I should have known um, that you were going to use this technology and that you were making these decisions about what you're doing to my body based upon, you know, algorithms that you also don't understand. Um, so it's an interesting question that's not resolved. Yeah, really, really great points. And I think you touch upon really important, um, you know, areas that are under discussion in sort of augmented intelligence and healthcare in general, right? So sort of on opening up that black box of machine learning to really have it be interpretable for the people who are using it. It is so important to be like, well, what features are going into this risk model? Are those the same things that, you know, I sort of judge and look at as a, as a physician? And, you know, at the same point, at the same time, you know, physicians are often looking to online resources for, you know, help generating care or, you know, looking up things on up to date is a common uh, resource that physicians use not, and you're not really necessarily uh, expected to disclose that to patients is all sort of part of your clinical care and clinical judgment. So again, where it's, it's just such an interesting time and there's so many new questions that sort of remain to be discussed and um, answered. Um, so uh, a second question that I had that we sort of touched upon a little bit in your earlier slides is, you know, if the family of the patient, um, so patient A who went into cardiac arrest wants to sort of take some legal action about this, is there any sort of uh, legal responsibility that the algorithm developers have? Is it at the hospital level who the person who decided to use this algorithm, you know, where, where does that responsibility, you know, with the physician, of course, where does that responsibility sort of pan out? Yeah, that's a really interesting question where we'd really want to dig into this and further develop the facts. I mean, something that's very concerning, right, even just this fact pattern as it's written, it says the physician is most worried about patient A, but patient B has a higher risk score. Well, so, you know, the whole idea here is to empower the humans who are using these systems. And well, if you thought patient A was more, had the more worrisome case, like, why did you go to patient B? Why did you just do what the algorithm said? Like, was, what was the, was that reasonable? Like, what do you know about how it works and, and why, how you made that decision? So think about the physician, um, thinking about the institution, how, how was this put into place? How was it validated? Um, how were people trained to use it? Uh, and then when it comes to these, these software uh, companies, the developers, uh, you know, the again, the institution, we're going to want to look at the contract between the, the institution and the provider. Uh, and then there's some, uh, of course, the, the, the developer could end up being liable to the end patient, right, uh, for negligent design or something like that. There's some questions around the extent to which product liability applies to some of these tools. Is it software or is it a product? Uh, that's something I guess that I think that we're going to see sorted out in the courts. But, you know, absolutely a case like this is is something that um, would, would raise raise concerns for everyone involved, without a doubt. Thank you. Really interesting to to hear sort of your thoughts for that. And again, I think a lot of it will just sounds like it, it'll take time and it'll take cases and examples like this. Then we'll sort of eventually come to a, um, a sort of consensus. Um, I think there's a next slide then. is an example um, that's very, it's maybe similar to the hypothetical in um, Epic launched a clinical prediction tool during COVID um, deterioration index. And the index was designed to help physicians decide when to move a patient into and out of intensive care with criteria using breathing rate and blood potassium levels. What's interesting about this is the company has not made, to my knowledge, the underlying algorithm available. So the question is, uh, has it been studied? Is there any peer review on this? Um, so this is an example, a real life example of where these kind of technologies are being used, but then maybe we don't understand the algorithm underneath of it. Um, and does that present any issues? And kind of what's interesting for me as a contractual attorney is these contracts that are negotiated between like Epic and 
you know, the health system are very heavily negotiated and the limitation of liability on these is something we fight about for like weeks, right? Because you want to be very careful on when they are going to be liable if they do something wrong and it, it damages you. So I think this is an area where lawyers are really focused too. And we're, we're always going to look back at that contract and say, you know, what was negotiated? What is the limit of liability? Um, and what's the potential risk and who's carrying that risk? Uh, there is actually a um, question online about uh, what has, what if it has been verified that the AI can improve triage in most of the cases, but it does make a few mistakes, who will be liable for that? It's really going to depend on the facts, right? And, and I think one of, to me, one of the key takeaways as we're implementing these tools, and I, I, I work mostly on the legal side, developing tools for lawyers and reminding lawyers like, you're in the loop here. You're the one making the decisions, right? And you can't outsource your judgment to a technology tool. And so I think you know, physicians and, and, and other healthcare providers, first and foremost, like you're the one making the decision. Like this, there's a source of, uh, an additional source of information and you have to exercise your judgment. Um, is it reliable to rely on that tool? What has been done to validate that tool? Uh, you know, all those sorts of questions kind of going back to some of the things we asked about before. Is it fair? Has the tool been validated for? Is there bias, right? What do we know about the training uh, data? Can we explain our understanding of how the system makes decisions, right? Unpacking kind of all those things around uh, around that scenario. I think one of the things as, as lawyers, right, is just because there's a bad outcome doesn't mean someone's liable, right? Everyone might have done everything correctly and and there's a bad outcome, which is unfortunate. And it's unpacking this and try to figure out what was the standard of care? You know, how did the, how did people um, make decisions in the moment? How did they exercise their judgment versus outsourcing their judgment to, to a machine, for example, without good reason for doing that? I just wanted to add to that. I think that's a really interesting point, right? And it could be that a lot of these, you know, algorithms are right. Like say they're right, like 99% of the time and they actually, if you as a physician disregarded that algorithm, so kind of going back to your different um, options of, you know, what the right choice is, what is suggested, you know, to some degree, if you're only listening to the algorithm when it reinforces you, it's not helping anybody, right? And there's also no innovation then. You're just kind of ig ignoring it to some degree. Um, but at the same time, you have to balance the risks of, you know, what if you listen to it and it's, and it's wrong and, you know, what area, what cut, line of acceptability of mistakes are there? I think these are really interesting questions that, you know, will will just kind of depend on how things go. And then I'm going to hand this off to Mohammed. Excellent. Thank you. So given my love of research and uh, research ethics, my case is uh, around that. So um, I have a dietitian called Mandy who's interested in the relationship between sugar intake during pregnancy and preterm birth. She starts using a chat GPT based application that obtains patients consent to participate in research and records they, their daily food, food intake. Once a month, the application sends patients information with dietary recommendations based on existing literature to Mandy. Subsequently, Mandy reviews these recommendations and sends them to patients. After providing suggestions to 100 pregnant women and following up on their end of pregnancy, Mandy notices that none of the white American mothers i.e. 78 of them had a preterm birth, but all African-Americans and Hispanic mothers had a preterm birth. Mothers who had a preterm birth do not know about this trend. And when asked about the research results, they are told that the PI has moved to another institution and all the research activities are thus halted. Mandy stops using the application in her new institution and decides against publishing her results as other projects are prioritized. Two years later, an advocacy group finds about mothers who were negatively affected and contacts Mandy and other dietitians who were among early users but did not publish their results. So my first question is, are there any legal grounds to sue Mandy? Um, and if yes, what precautionary measures could, ha could she have adopted in order to prevent being sued? So, Mohammed, I think you have a future career writing law school exams because this is a this is a really complicated one. Um, you know, just for fun, I'm going to go up to this computer up here too. We put this into to Chat GPT to see if it could sort out uh, what's actually going on here. And Andrew and I were surprised that we got a pretty 
interesting response. So we had access to the GPT-4 was just launched yesterday, right? So we put we didn't do any prompt engineering, just put the exact question in there, uh, with the, the background and the questions. I mean, one question I would ask first right away, just looking at this is like, well, it's not maybe clear how chat GPT was actually really used here. Like, how did it actually work? Like, what was it? Uh, you know, do do we have a any reason to believe that it could do uh, what we wanted it to do here effectively? Um, but just uh, it, the the response we got, right? We got all this caution back. It's not a lawyer, and you should go talk to a lawyer. Um, but it it spotted the issues, right? It spotted the majority uh, of the issues. Um, not a lot of deep analysis about whether there would be legal grounds to sue Mandy or not. Um, but it, but it did raise the the questions about negligence, potential breach of fiduciary duty, and infa and failure to uh, obtain informed consent from these these individuals. Um, it talked about precautionary things Mandy Mandy could do, right? Getting the informed consent, making sure the study design and implementation followed ethical uh, gu gu guidelines and best practices, um, attention uh, addressing potential biases and disparities. Uh, we didn't see anything about getting IRB approval in this, right? And presumably there seems like there's some things here that an IRB would have said, wait a second, you need to explain a little bit more what's going on and how we're doing this. Um, and there would have been some notification to the IRB at some point in time about uh, preliminary results. Uh, consulting with legal and ethical experts through the process. Uh, and then we, I can I can let you ask your other questions uh, here, but uh so we we got some decent responses too on on those other questions but so that was that was pretty interesting just as a starting a starting point and andrea i know you flagged maybe a couple of things there that would be worth talking about uh, sure um so my first reaction when looking at this um was who would potentially have liability and i was also thinking about the irb and the fact that we're talking about pregnant women here so pregnant women are a special high risk population um special obligations, special standard of care, potentially that would apply to these individuals. Um, why did the IRB approve this? What were the circumstances around that approval? Um, were the informed consent documents reviewed? What was in the informed consent? Were they appropriately informed of the risks? Um, was the application tested? Was, you know, how was it used? I think is a great question. Um, are some of the things that immediately come to mind? And then I think about Mandy and I question, you know, some of the things that she did, whether she should have on learning this information immediately halted her research and informed um, the IRB or her institution that there may be some adverse events. Um, so thinking about that. And then if these individuals wanted to sue Mandy as a lawyer, I would say, well, I don't know that you want to sue Mandy because Mandy probably isn't independently wealthy, but maybe the institution that she works at uh, has money. So what kind of liability could they potentially have? Um, so those are some immediate things. I'd like to add. Um, so it's interesting that um, you mentioned the IRB. Um, for me, the point from a research ethics perspective is non-publication of important results. Um, the so-called file drawer problem. And it's interesting that, well, the chat GPT didn't pick up on that, but as far as I know, IRB would never mandate you to publish your results. Again, to the extent I know, I don't think IRB would force one to publish their results. That's the problem. So in that sense, given that we have this issue at our, in our hands, what are the legal grounds to sue Mandy based on non-publication of important results? or non-publication of life-saving results? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the questions that you looked into that we asked before is how might this information be disclosed? And um, if there was a lawsuit filed, of course, there's ways to, you have process now, you can serve discovery requests, you can send a subpoena to the institution or to the maker of the AI tool and request that information be produced, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not so sure that there's a, a, a lot of, um, a lot to look at to for the law to force for there to be publication uh, here of this. And then I think you raised a question too about um, if you do publish it, might you incur a liability for defaming the... Exactly. And that's a good segue to the second question. So if she were to publish her results, could the developers of the app file a lawsuit against her? And I think you also had a response from ChatGPT on this, no? Yeah, there there was some information, and I think it it did a good job spotting. I mean, we did prompt it. I mean, we have the word defamation in there, uh, but it it said, you know, defamation occurs when someone makes a false statement that harms another person's reputation. If Mandy publishes her results accurately and truthfully, 
And without making a false or mis misleading statements about the app or its developers, it's unlikely that a defamation claim would be successful. However, this depends on the specific jurisdiction and its defamation laws. So that seems spot on. Of course, the other thing to consider is that more and more the developers of these tools are putting in their terms and conditions and very much limiting how you can use the tool. So if the terms and conditions here said you cannot use this for research, you cannot publish anything about it, you might not have a defamation issue, but you might have an issue under the contract where they would say to Mandy, hey, we gave you our tool based on these terms and conditions and you breached the contract when you did this. Uh, so that could definitely be a, a problem. Interesting. Um, and then the last question was, under what circumstances would legal authorities be able to pressure Mandy or developers to share data? Yeah, and, and so we talked about just a little bit if there's a lawsuit, right, to be able to pressure it. So once you know about it, there's some definitely some things that can happen and there are definitely um, the IRB might get involved or different government agencies might do investigations and try to, to cause to be published. But the the key hurdle that you pointed out at the beginning, Mohammed, that if this research is done and there's a bad outcome and it's kind of put in the file drawer and no one knows about it, then um, you know that's going to be you know, all of these things would require people to to know about it to put that in 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 process. Excellent, thank you. I think yeah. we have only one comment from the online audience was that the IRB could mandate that the information is shared with participants, and that could be part of the consent. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, anybody in the audience have a question? We have mics on the two sides. There's there's a microphone up there. You, they can't hear you online. This is a brave new world of hybrid. Okay, so I know I know this is a chat GPT focused talk, but you talked about doctors understanding the algorithms, but there's a lot of algorithms that doctors use. I mean, let's say CT scan, it takes a x-ray and then it does solves integral equations of the second kind to create a three-dimensional. I don't think many people in the world understand how it works exactly. So understanding the algorithm is a very high bar in many of the algorithms that you use. From a legal perspective, I think what I would say is that having a functional understanding of it, or at least under being able to say, well, this system was validated and, and I understand how it was validated. I understand its error rates. I understand when it may, you know, what circumstances it may fail and, and things like that, right? So. There's a difference, I think, between having a full explainability and understanding how it works at the algorithmic level versus having a functional understanding and also having, you know, having done some diligence, right? Understanding how it was developed and and having being able to assure people around that it would actually work and is fit for the specific problem you're trying to solve. And just to add on this, I agree with the point that there's always um, the need to have human involvement with, you know, when we're analyzing the outputs of such systems. So it's very common for physicians. We prepare by the bedside and even before we do a lot of chart digging to understand the case. And once we go by the bedside, sometimes actually the patient will elicit and offer something completely different that will change the diagnosis. We, you know, was ChatGPT aware of that? Do we even care now that the diagnosis is clear? You know, nothing will substitute the bad side. Let me ask just one question. So it sounds to me like uh, as a practicing physician, a lot of the blame ultimately comes back to you, but the credit could go to the algorithm. But but is does that change uh, if, it's, if it's an FDA approved like software device? Like some of these algorithms are software as like a device now. I mean, certainly there's been plenty of legal action against device manufacturers. Does there is a precedent there? Does that would that apply to people that are uh, developing algorithms which are sort of implanted in the digital record now? I mean, does that have some? Well, I'll just jump in first on the the first part. I mean, I think in the triage example, for example, if the doctor could say, "We've tested this system, and we know that time and time again, its judgment outperforms us for certain types of cases, and this was one of those cases where we should rely on what the algorithm said." Right? Like that's a lot better answer than I just did what the machine told me. Right? So I don't think it's it's just exercising good judgment in that system. But as far as FDA approval changing that. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the answer to that question, but I think it's a really good question. And I, I put my, as a lawyer, I feel for physicians in this situation because it's like, I use technology tools as a lawyer as well. And at the end of the day, I'm liable for, for malpractice. 
And if I don't know how those tools are performing and I don't know the ins and outs of them, it's on me. You know, somebody has to be liable at the end of the day. So I think it's really hard because these technologies are so new and they're so complicated and they're getting more and more complicated. Is it really fair to say to a physician, you have to know all this stuff? I mean, it's just, it's really hard conundrum um, that I, I don't have it solved, but it's a tricky one. Well, thank you. It's a brave and scary new world. Um, what I realize is that uh, a panel is a great way to get free legal advice. So maybe we'll bring people back for a very focused discussions. But I, I do want to thank the audience that was here in person today and also all the folks who are online. Uh, do uh, 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 reach out to us. Uh, our website is here. Uh, there's a sign up for membership. If you do sign up, what it allows us to do is to reach back out to you about future events. This is just one in a series of discussions we're having on campus. And so we uh, are having some on the on the Evanston campus, some here on this campus, and then we're actually moving forward with certain workshops. We're doing workshopping sessions to try to work through using these technologies to actually try to solve real world problems, at least in our domain. So if you're interested in participating in those workshops, let us know, you'll find out more from our website. So again, thanks everyone. And again, thank you to our presenters today. Thank you very much.